Now, all cults, all fraternities, all churches, all denominations have their symbols. We know the symbols and we know the, what we're looking at, whether it's a church, a synagogue, a mosque, whether it's a policeman, or whether it's a fireman, or whether it's a nurse. We know things by their symbols. So fascism, what are the symbols of fascism? One might think it's a swastika. Actually, it is not. The symbols of international fascism are much older than that. And the key symbol, the cardinal symbol of the fascist movements of the world, is a bundle of rods with a hatchet in the middle of them. This is called the fasce, or the fasces. It's an old Roman symbol, but it even predates the Romans. Where do we find it? On the back of the Congress room. The Freemasonic monopoly of government positions continued for at least the first hundred years of United States history. According to a 1924 census, even in that year, the Senate had a membership which was 60% Freemason. But what worries me more is why, of all the symbols that you could possibly choose, the symbols for international fascism are there in the Senate room at the back. Now, James W. Wardner, in his book on Holy Alliances, says, Our first president was a Mason, sworn into office by the Grand Master of New York on a Bible taken from a Masonic altar, that of St. John's Lodge No. 1. The Bible used in the ceremony was brought there by John Morton, Marshal of the Day from St. John's Lodge of which he was the worshipful master. Thus was laid the cornerstone of our country and forever of our government. This same Bible, used for Washington's inauguration, was used to swear in Masonic presidents Warren Harding in 1921 and Dwight Eisenhower in 1953. We are citizens. It's a word that doesn't just describe our nationality or our legal status. It describes the way we're made. Thank you. Thank you. 51 years ago, John F. Kennedy declared to this chamber that the Constitution makes us not rivals for power, but partners for progress. Tonight, thanks to the grit and determination of the American people, there is much progress to report. After a decade of grinding war, our brave men and women in uniform are coming home. Our businesses have created over six million new jobs. We buy more American cars than we have in five years, and less foreign oil than we have in 20. We won't grow the middle class simply by shifting the cost of health care or college onto families that are already struggling, or by forcing communities to lay off more teachers and more cops and more firefighters. Most Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, understand that we can't just cut our way to prosperity. They know that broad-based economic growth requires a balanced approach to deficit reduction, with spending cuts and revenue, and with everybody doing their fair share. But as Americans, we all share the same proud title. We are citizens. It's a word that doesn't just describe our nationality or our legal status. It describes the way we're made. It describes what we believe. It captures the enduring idea that this country only works when we accept certain obligations to one another and to future generations that our rights are wrapped up in the rights of others, and that well into our third century as a nation, it remains the task of us all, as citizens of these United States, to be the authors of the next great chapter of our American story. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless these United States of America.